Okay, gang, welcome back to another exciting lecture on exercise is medicine for cancer management. This is uh, one, this is our second special populations um, lecture that we're focusing on. So previously we looked at how specific athletes can uh, fall under the category of special populations due to overtraining and fatigue and weight cycling. Um, and now we're gonna look at uh, special populations that are dealing with a chronic illness or um, a, a disease that is uh, trying to take their life. So. This uh, lecture is kind of a combination of some research that I pulled out for you guys just to kind of demonstrate where we are in our understanding of how exercise um, can mitigate the effects of cancer or prevent cancer or help us recover from cancer or treatment of cancer and also help us um, not succumb to uh, not to die from from cancer or a, a specific type of cancer so um, it's going to feel a bit disjointed because we're still really trying to figure out how exercise is associated with cancer uh, and how it can help reduce or mitigate um, the side effects of cancer so um, with no further ado, let's kind of get into this and talk about some of the, the things that I found for you um, that are becoming more clear in research and in medicine and in exercise physiology. So we do know that exercise is medicine. We've been talking about that since the beginning of the semester. Um, that is ACSM's model that exercise is medicine, and they're going to be presenting some information here that demonstrates how, in this particular case, um, bouts of exercise, chronic exercise, does help reduce this, this horrible disease that uh, millions of people are living with. So um, we know that exercise has a profound effect on hormones and cytokines, right? Positive effect on hormones and cytokines. Uh, there are many types of cancers that do form from um, hormone dysregulation or an overabundance of a certain hormone being secreted or an overabundance of uh, receptors that receive these hormones being expressed. So there can be a disproportion of either hormone signaling or receptor upregulation that can lead to certain types of cancer, uh, such as breast and prostate cancer. Um, and we know that exercise, the more we exercise, the more we have structural adaptation and repair, and that repair is generally an acute repair process. So we get uh, beneficial inflammation that turns on and turns off and it repairs uh, specific systems or specific structures and um, most importantly it helps with protein turnover um, and I've mentioned this before in class that you know every protein in our body has a shelf life it has an expiration date and we want to make sure that once a protein is malfunctioning or no longer um, doing its job effectively we get rid of it so we have proteases that are turned on they find the old uh, decrepit protein they destroy it and they recycle the amino acids that made up that um, that protein. So exercise is a wonderful inducer of protein turnover. Uh, we have remarkable adaptations that occur with exercise that assist with both blood perfusion and vascular adaptations, both which are very important with cancer, uh, specifically because tumors are highly vascularized um, uh, mutations. So um, they will want to hijack um, certain vessels and capillary beds so that they can get uh, a lot of blood and a lot of glucose to the tumor to feed it and to help it metastasize. Um, and exercise basically facilitates other therapies and reduces side effects that we see with um, other sorts of chronic illnesses and comorbidities. Um, so it's important to understand that in the presence of cancer, you become more susceptible and more prone to other chronic illnesses like cardiovascular disease and diabetes. And likewise, the same is true for the other direction. If you have diabetes, if you have uh, heart disease, if you have um, cardiovascular disease, you are also more susceptible to developing certain cancers because there's a synergy among these these conditions that speak with one another, they communicate with one another, and there's these axes in which they can um, turn on other diseases through a existing disease. Okay, so keep that in mind. So what I have for you here is the cancer framework, and this is essentially the continuum of what happens um, when somebody is 
diagnosed with cancer, which is represented by this line here. And then the, the kind of mini phases that occur um, through cancer recovery, if somebody were to survive, um, what occurs to the end of life, uh, treatment, pre-treatment, um, what treatments are effective, recovery, disease prevention. So, so this is kind of the continuum that, that shows um, what occurs over the course of somebody dealing with or battling cancer. And then over here on this side is pre um, prevention and detection and pre-screening and pre-diagnosis. So um, like I said, what I, what I did is I put together a bunch of information for you guys that talks a lot about how um, cancer can be avoided through diet and through exercise. Diet is very important as well. Uh, lots of vegetables, lots of polyphenols, lots of antioxidants, right? These things that are very high in plants uh, also reduce um, the potential of developing certain cancers where if you are uh, doing one of those carnivore diets or a very high protein diet with lots of meat and cheeses and dairies and eggs, um, those are considered to be more carcinogenic um, than a plant-based diet simply because it, they don't have any protective properties that help stop and inhibit cancer. Rather, they have things that help accelerate cancer. So diet and exercise are both very important. Um, so we're going to look at a couple of these things um, more closely over the duration of this kind of small presentation. Um, and let's let's start with survival. Let's just kind of look at this first. So um, there was a study done that showed basically cancer survival and the accumulation of data that suggests that there is a strong link between physical activity and cancer survival. And this was a study that basically looked at uh, a bunch of different data that basically allows um, medical practitioners or doctors to prescribe exercise as a form of surviving cancer or avoiding the development of cancer. So this is one of the first papers that kind of shows us that, yes, the medical community recognizes that there's a strong association between survivability of cancer and exercise. So... Um, this data accumulates suggests that there's a strong link between physical activity and cancer survival, okay? So ultimately, what doctors tell patients about exercise is that exercise may be beneficial, and this is based largely upon proven associations that exist between physical activity and specific comorbidity conditions, okay? So what this is saying is that exercise will help reduce the exacerbation of cancer by fighting diseases such as osteoporosis, heart disease, and diabetes. And as I said earlier, there's a really strong connection. There's a synergistic connection between cancer and other comorbidities such as heart disease, osteoporosis, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes. Um, and cancer survivors are specifically prone to those comorbidities as well. So um, that is a really important finding that suggests that if we do exercise and if we do maintain a healthy diet and we can keep away these other diseases, these other comorbidities, then we better our chances of surviving cancer. Now, if we um, are not exercising and we are just kind of eating whatever we want and we're undergoing, uh, let's say, chemotherapy. And um, through this process, we start to develop other issues and other complications. Well, that's going to accelerate the rate of cancer growth and potentially get you closer to in stages of life. So um, that came from this paper, a really cool paper. Um, and some other things that they found uh, from these cohort studies is, uh, this is really interesting. So this group looked at studies of breast cancer, okay, 26 studies of breast cancer, colon, colorectal cancer, prostate cancer patients. And they found that there is a 37% reduction in the risk of cancer-specific mortality, okay? So again, if you have cancer, if you, you've developed cancer and you have survived cancer, if you exercise, and what's so interesting about this study is it it's kind of true for all of these very different um, types of cancer, right? Breast cancer, colorectal cancer, prostate cancer. Um, all of these cancers are reduced by 37 to 40% if 
somebody exercises. So your cancer specific mortality is decreased by it. And, and if we round that up, that's, that's close to 50%. That's a remarkable finding. Um, and then when you have people that are not active, people, patients that are not active, that are recovering from cancer and trying to survive cancer, um, this goes down to basically zero, right? So you, you have, uh, you do not have any protective effect of exercise, um, which will help reduce mortality caused by cancer, all right? Um, they also found that the risk of a reoccurrence is reduced. So not only can you protect yourself um, and help and assist your recovery of cancer if you exercise, but also the risk of reoccurrence of cancer um, is, is blunted as well. So um, this cohort study found that post-diagnosis, so after you've already been diagnosed, you can help your body heal through exercise, you can fend off other comorbidities, and you can reduce the reoccurrence of cancer substantially just by exercising. So that was a remarkable study. And again, so a lot of these things are very preliminary, okay? Um, we still don't fully understand the mechanisms of why this happens, but this is a cohort study. So this is looking at big values. It looks looking at a lot of different people, right? You can see here, um, this looked at several different papers from 2011 to, I think this was 2018 here, 24, 25, right? So we're looking at big numbers here and we're seeing that, um, people that exercise with through these different studies have been more beneficial at surviving cancer than people that have not exercised. Um, now, if we look at treatment, right? So let's kind of look back at this here. So we look at, let's pick another spot here. So we looked at survival, um, survivorship. Let's look at treatment and treatment effectiveness. Okay. So another study found that, um, you can reduce the risk of reoccurrence of death by 50 to 60% if you exercise with chemotherapy, okay? Exercise is not an alternative to chemotherapy, but it is a critical synergistic medicine, which means that when you are receiving chemotherapy, exercising is more beneficial in helping you recover than not exercising. And if we, as, as we look um, deeper into this discussion a little later, um, we'll talk about why that might be true, okay? Um, so, and this comes from the Journal of Clinical Oncology where they found that you can increase your chances of surviving uh, both cancer and chemotherapy through exercise. So um, not only can we fend off um, comorbidities through exercise, which would help us survive cancer. Um, we can help eliminate the reoccurrence of cancer through exercise. And now this one's saying that if we're undergoing treatment and we are receiving chemotherapy, that exercise uh, can't replace the effects of chemotherapy, but it can help reduce the reoccurrence or death by 50 to 60% from chemotherapy or cancer, okay? So it has this really robust protective effect. Um, now, the American College of Sports Medicine has, has kind of um, figured out that uh, exercise is medicine in the face of cancer as well. And they've done, they've done some cohort studies, they've done some meta-analyses, and they found that um, there are several mechanisms that are associated with different types of cancer and they they trying to figure out how exercise is protective against those types of cancer um so what they found is that um they did this round table discussion with all these experts on um, exercise and and cancer and they found essentially that exercise for cancer prevention and treatment is an accurate and true statement and they found that exercise and prevention and treatment of cancer is associated with all of these different types of cancer, right? So um, if you take medication, medication is generally, um, it, the agents in medication act usually within a specific region. So they have a local agent that will act and, and communicate with uh, liver cells or communicate with uh, renal cells or communicate with uh, adipose tissue, right? So what's so remarkable about this is, is this type of exercise, or I'm sorry, this type of treatment, right? Exercise 
it's it's like global, right? It's universal. Like it's they found that exercise interacts with all of these different types of cancer: bladder cancer, esophageal cancer, stomach cancer, colon cancer. Um, and they have basically identified uh, these statements that show how exercise is beneficial. Um, so the new evidence-based guidelines for recommendations include um, all adults exercise. For all adults, exercise is important for cancer prevention, and this specifically lowers the risk of seven common types of cancer, colon, breast, um, kidney, bladder, esophagus, and stomach. Um, and they say, likewise, for cancer survivors, in, um, incorporate exercise to help improve survival after diagnosis. And again, they found that to be true in breast, colon, and prostate. Um, so exercise during and after cancer treatment improves fatigue, anxiety, depression, and physical function. Um, and they're going to continue to do research that will drive these inquiries. But from the large cohort studies they have done and from the meta-analysis that they've done, they've seen that there is a positive association with exercise and these types of cancers. Okay, Most importantly, for prevention um, and for surviving and for improving life after you are undergoing uh, treatment for cancer, okay? So they divine, they designed and they developed this graph here. Um, I will go through this quickly with you guys, but um, you guys can look at this at your own pace. I will upregulate, I'm sorry, I, I will upload this onto the um, module this week so you have a copy of this. And they're saying exercise can prevent seven cancers and assist you with the survival of three common cancers. Um, and they show outcomes, aerobic only, resistant only, and this would be uh, concurrent training, so a combination of aerobic and resistance. So up here they have the statement that says overall, avoid, avoid um, inactivity and to improve general health, aim to achieve the current physical activity guidelines for health. Okay, this is something that you guys are very used to because we've been talking about these guidelines over the entire course of this semester. Uh, so you should be uh, very well versed with this. Um, so they say that there is strong evidence that uh, exercise helps alleviate cancer-related fatigue. Well, obviously, if you're uh, receiving chemotherapy and every cell and tissue in your body is being destroyed through this toxin, um, you will be fatigued. Um, Health-related quality of life, physical function, anxiety, depression, lymphedemia. Um, so it gives you doses. Right, So we're very used to seeing this three times a week, 30 minutes per session, two to three times a week, 60 to 30 to 60 uh, minutes per session and so forth. Um, that would be aerobic training. So if you do aerobic training during this time, uh, during these time frames, then uh, you should have a beneficial effect that helps with these particular components of cancer. I'm sorry about that. Um, if we do resistant training, resistant training, they're saying do it two times a week, two sets of 12 to 15, two sets of eight to 15, two to three times a week, two sets of eight to 12. Now, what's interesting about this is we are only seeing two sets, right? So there is a reduction in the prescription of exercise and uh, cancer patients. And that makes sense, right? So um, we can't prescribe them the same rep range, set range, um, intensity, duration as somebody who is uh, healthy and not living with a, a disease like this. Um, and then you can see the same thing true here for aerobic and resistant training. So this would be concurrent training. Again, we have the two sets, 12 to 15, two sets, eight to 15. So this... Um, this rep range should tell you that it's more endurance than muscle building, right? It's not resistant training where we're trying to build hypertrophy. And the reason being is uh, when you're receiving um, chemotherapy, you're destroying protein, right? So protein synthesis is a very tough thing to accomplish because once you receive a dose of chemotherapy, 
the body is trying to regenerate itself and repair itself through protein synthesis. So um, to think that you will be able to put on size and muscle when you are in a constant state of protein degradation and protein synthesis due to chemotherapy, um, that would not be achievable. So what we're trying to do here is just maintain some type of muscle integrity um, through exercise that is two sets, 12 to 15 reps. Um, and same thing here, we're trying to maintain the positive adaptations of cardiovascular training, whether those adaptations are of the heart, of VO2, of uh, vascular system, right? So we want to have um, more capillary density. We want to be able to deliver more oxygen, right? So keeping a strong aerobic capacity is also important uh, when you're trying to um, live with a disease like this or trying to recover from a disease like this. Um, so it just kind of keep that in mind. And then there's moderate evidence that says that bone health and sleep are also um, impacted by this by these uh, prescriptions here. Um, but as you can see with bone health, very insufficient evidence and with sleep, uh, insufficient evidence as well with resistant training and a combination of the two. So um, this is where we are with our understanding of exercise and cancer. Now, if we look at what we see, well, let's just look at the last few slides. If we look at this, we look at this, right? We look at what ACSM says. We look at their statements and then we look at this prescription. We, we really, we don't have any mechanisms yet that are telling us how exercise is helping fight cancer, right? So this is, these, this is a very uh, generic in a sense, right? So we know that there's associations, but we just, we don't have enough evidence to basically identify how exercise is working, right? We're just taking large groups of data, large groups of um, meta-analysis data, and we're saying this is what we see with groups that exercise. There is a significant difference between them and groups that don't exercise. And basically what we can what we can say from this association is that it increases your risk. It, I'm sorry, it increases your survivability of the disease. It reduces your risk of further developing comorbidities, which would accelerate cancer. And it also helps to reduce the reoccurrence of cancer. Um, we also know that it helps prevent cancer. All right. So from what I've showed you so far, these kind of surface level studies that is just looking at data, we, we really don't have mechanisms that we can say, okay, well, this is what's happening and this is why it's reducing cancer. Um, fortunately, I was able to pick up some studies that did find mechanisms and we're going to talk about how exercise might, and I say might because we haven't seen consistent data, might reduce tumor size and tumor um metastasis. Okay, so now I'm going to show you guys some of the mechanisms that might be involved in reduction of cancer um, by exercise. So we know that exercise is it's a stimulus and it's a signal and it produces modifications and adaptations that are beneficial for health. So what we do understand is that exercise is directly upregulates and modifies gene expression. So um, this is important because research has come out that shows that exercise um, ex it activates genes, turns genes on, and therefore produces proteins that are protective and anti-carcinogenic. Um, there's a bunch of studies that came out showing that exercise plays a big role in reducing breast cancer uh, and prostate cancer because of how it, it expresses genes and what it does to modulate genes, okay? So it has a gene protective effect, okay? And it's going to activate genes that are pro-protective, okay? Protective against cancer. We also know that exercise has a big role on telomere or telomere, however you want to pronounce that. There's two different ways of doing it alterations. For, so for those of you that don't know what telomeres are, it is these little end caps here on the end of our, uh, our DNA and our genes. Um, 
So what happens is as we get older and we start to experience cellular senescence, um, these telomeres or telomeres, they get smaller. And the smaller they get, that means that the older the cell is getting or the older the DNA is getting um, and the older it gets, the more susceptible it is to mutation. Okay, And mutation is associated with cancer development. So one of the things that exercise does is it activates a enzyme called telomerase or telomerase. And telomerase does this remarkable job of interacting with the telomeres and rebuilding them and making them longer, thereby reducing uh, cellular senescence or cellular aging and increasing basically the youth of cells, okay? So exercise has a positive effect on gene expression, which helps reduce cancer, helps fight cancer. It helps keep uh, cells, DNA, um, genes safe and young by upregulating something called telomerase, which helps keep these telomeres nice and long. We don't want them to be short like this. Um, exercise modulates circulatory factors, okay? So insulin, growth factors, sex steroid hormones. Insulin is a growth factor, okay? It tells the body to grow. It tells the body to build and to store, right? Um, insulin has its own pathway, which is the insulin pathway, but it also activates something called the MAP kinase pathway, which tells the cells to divide and grow. So when we exercise and we control insulin, we control insulin secretion. If we don't exercise and we become insulin resistant, well, guess what? Insulin is turned on all the time because the, the tissue is resistant to insulin Sugar can't get in the cell, so the body thinks that the best way to fix that is just to secrete insulin all the time. Now, when the body secretes insulin all the time, that's called um, contemporary, um, I'm sorry, it is called compensatory hyperinsulinemia. Um, when insulin is on all the time, Sugar still doesn't get into the cell, but it activates that other pathway, that MAP kinase path pathway, which tells the cells to divide, right? And if we have division, 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 then we run into problems of cell division regulation, and then we start to develop tumors, okay? Um, we know that exercise improves immune function, right? You guys just watched that video on immune function and how exercise helps kind of regulate that. Exercise also helps regulate the secretion of hormones and receptors that are associated with hormones, right? So um, this is a big one for developing prostate cancer and breast cancer. So exercise helps to kind of regulate these processes. Um, exercise reduces systemic inflammation and oxidative stress. And most importantly, exercise changes vascularization in tumors. So um, we can see a tumor here that's kind of robust in size. And as we exercise, we get a reduction of tumor size. So all of these things act synergistically and kind of help reverse cancer development and the exacerbation of cancer. All right, so these are some kind of generic mechanisms here that we understand that they are working to protect us and exercise is helping play a big role in all of these. Um, now, um, one study that I found, uh, they did this really cool study where they took cancer cells, right? So they did cell culture and they found a line of cancer cells called LNCAP, okay? That is a, a line of, uh, I believe it's prostate cancer cells. And they took serum um, from humans, and they basically bathed these cells in human serum. And they wanted to see what the serum would do to the cells. Would it promote the growth of these cancer cells or would it reduce the growth of the cancer cells? So they took cells from two different people, people that were resting and did no exercise and people that were exercising. And they found something remarkable. The serum that they took, so the blood samples that they took from uh, people that were exercising, is here in the red, after 96 hours of incubation, people that exercised, ver sorry, versus people that did not exercise had a significant reduction in the growth of these tumor cells, all right? So there was something in 
the serum that inhibited the tumor cells from growing. Okay. Um, uh, and this, this would be just normal cells that are, that's in a normal solution. So, um, whenever we do cell culture, we have to keep the cells in a solution that basically feeds them. So this is normal cells in I'm sorry, this is the cancer cells in their normal media. That's usually provided by a manufacturer. These are cells that were bathed in human serum that were resting. And these were cells bathed in human serum uh, that were exercising. And after 96 hours, there was a reduction in tumor growth. Okay. So exercise is medicine. Um, there's another uh, graph that this group presented and I'm going to show you guys it here. So this one here should look familiar to you. I just showed you this one here. Uh, this prostate cancer cell line at 96 hours, we had a significant difference between um, blood um, serum that was uh, not exercised and serum that was exercised. Um, what was interesting is at 24 hours, there was no change. At 48 hours, there was no change. But then at 96 hours, we could see that those cancer cells started to grow. And the reason they put this guy here, this, this black bar, is this is the control. Okay, so these are cells that are being bathed in a medium that is designed by a manufacturer um, that is filled with the right nutrients and the right signals to tell those cells to grow. So this is acting as a control. So this is saying that after 24 hours, the control hasn't grown. After 48 hours, the control hasn't grown. But then after 96 hours, all of them have grown. So it, it appears that a cancer uh, cell or a cell line needs about three days uh, in order for it to fully start to grow and increase in size. So now the control and the human serum grew almost at the same rate. And the blood samples that were taken from people that were exercised and the serum that was extracted from that, uh, that had a protective effect and we did not have that same rate of growth. Um, so there, they wanted to uh, also see if just this particular cell line is just sensitive to um, the human serum. So they wanted to get another cell line, another cancer cell line, to see if they could find the same sort of effects. And they, did, they took this guy here, the 22RV, which is another type of cell. And they saw very similar trends after 96 hours. However, it wasn't significant, but it was trending. So that's why they put that p-value there, just to show you that um, it was a very similar effect, just not significant. And um, sometimes with cell culture, um, when you have a trend like that, it's still it's still significant. It's still an important finding. Now, what these represent here is fibroblasts. And fibroblasts play an important role in cancer development. Um, and what's interesting about this is they found that fibroblasts grew in both the rest and the exercise serum. And it grew even more so than in the control. So um, let's look at that for a second. Let's look at the, the mechanisms that are involved in, in that. Okay. So fibroblasts are associated with cancer. Um, it is a type of cell within the tumor microenvironment that promotes uh, tumorigenic features. Okay. And it basically helps to remodel the extracellular matrix um, and it secretes cytokines. So you guys should know what a cytokine is now because you guys watched um, the immune system uh, video and now you should kind of be up to speed on what a cytokine in, is and what it does. So we can see that um, these fibroblasts, they basically help kind of protect and promote cancer cells and they kind of help them um, build and grow and metastasize. So uh, they create these membranes, as you can see here, this would be a fibroblast, this is a fibroblast, this is a fibroblast. Um, they become active and they help kind of create this membrane around the tumor cells. So what is interesting is that if we go back to that last slide, we can see that exercise had a protective effect on reducing tumor size, right? But it also, 
increased fibroblasts in a manner that was equivalent to those who were at rest. So the next question should be, well, what is, what is the fibroblast activation doing in this particular case? Is it protective? Is it creating a stronger tumor microenvironment and promoting uh, tumorogenic features? Or is it uh, somehow inhibiting tumor growth? And that's something that we, we really just don't know yet. Um, so more, more research is going to have to be done on that. But what I want to show you guys is an appreciation of how this type of research works. And this is, this is translational research. Um, this is what I spent most of my PhD doing, which was looking at um, these things within inside the cell or in the cellular environment that are altered by exercise and how it's protective against a disease that is also present in the cell. Um, so there was uh, another study I found that looked at how exercise acts as immunotherapy. And again, talking about immunotherapy, we were talking about the immune system, right? The innate and the adaptive immune system. Hopefully you guys watched that video and this will all be more clear for you guys. Um, so another study found that individuals that uh, were exercising they induced this immunotherapy effect. Uh, they have improved immune function, which also increased um, the cellular, which increased the protective mechanisms within the cell um, and reduced uh, tumor volume. So you can see here that controls that did no exercise and people that were exercising through activating the innate immune system had a reduction in tumor volumes, okay? So again, we don't really know what that mechanism is, but I, I have a slide that's going to, I had to do a little bit of digging to see if I could figure out uh, how I could present that to you that might show how a tumor is being reduced um, through exercise and through the immune system. And I think what most of the research is showing is that the natural killer cells uh, the NK cells, which you guys hopefully watched in the immune system video, um, are becoming activated and are playing a role in reducing tumor size. Um, so I found another one that showed how epinephrine uh, plays a role in reducing tumor size. And it acts synergistically with IL-6, which is a cytokine, and natural killer cells. Um, so there seems to be this crosstalk between tumor growth epinephrine, IL-6, and natural killer cells. Um, so here you can see people, uh, controlled cells, or controlled uh, group. Um, these are tumors in the control group. Okay, very disgusting, large masses. Um, and these are tumors that are uh, in the exercise group, and you can see that there's a large reduction in this black mass here. And um, I believe what this black mass is, is hypoxic tissue in the tumor. So um, hypoxic tissue is the part of the tumor that receives the least amount of oxygen and receives the least amount of blood supply. And it is harder for uh, medications, anti-tumor medications, to get to these parts of the tumor because they're so far away from the capillary or from the blood vessel. And this is the way that uh, tumors try to stay alive is they grow outward and away from blood supplies, large blood supplies, where medications can't get to them. But as you can see here, um, these tumors have far less of that hypoxic tumor tissue. Um, so exercising, running, is somehow activating uh, or reducing uh, the tumor size and also reducing the hypoxic tissue in the tumor. So um, I thought that was a really interesting interesting slide. So here's the mechanisms that they think might be responsible for uh, this change in tumor growth. So uh, let's just kind of look at this um, this figure right here. We can see that there's epinephrine. We know that when we exercise, epinephrine is released and mobilized. We know that when we exercise, contracting muscles release cytokines, IL-6. These are interleukin-6, interleukin-7, and interleukin-15. We've talked about these before in class. Um, we know that... Um, 
the vascularization and perfusion of blood becomes greater when we exercise. Um, we get more vascularization and more blood perfusion. And somehow all of these things are acting synergistically to activate natural killer cells and to help have this anti uh, cancer effect. So, this group found that exercise controls tumor growth through epinephrine dependent mobilization of natural killer cells. Okay, so they know that somehow all of these players are communicating with natural killer cells. Um, muscle derived muscle derived exercise factors known as myokines, right? That's these guys here, can regulate natural killer cell proliferation, maturation, and activation. Okay, um, and this somehow activates crosstalk with the immune system during exercise, uh, which basically um, activates this whole process of prolifer proliferation, maturation, and activation, right? So natural killer cells, they don't just circulate in the cell turned on, right? They're not just active. They have to pro proliferate. They have to mature, grow into full-size cells, and then something has to activate them. And they believe that the activation is this crosstalk between epinephrine and these cytokines. Um, so basically, this process helps result in hypoxia, right? Hypoxia of the anti, uh, hypoxia of the tumor, right? Um, and this is one of the mechanisms that groups are looking at to try to figure out how exercise is reducing tumor cells and having an anti-cancer or anti-carcinogenic effect. Um, so somehow these pieces here are all playing a role in reducing tumor sizes. Okay. Um, and then And the last one I want to show you guys is um, basically how uh, individuals are recovering from radiation therapy or chemotherapy through exercise. Um, like I stated earlier in the, the lecture is when you're undergoing uh, chemotherapy, you're, you're in this process of constant protein degradation and constant protein synthesis, right? So the, the chemotherapy is destroying every protein in the body. That's why, that's why we lose our hair. Hair is protein. Um, so when people undergo chemotherapy, generally they are prescribed a very high protein diet. And that diet is to help them with the synthesis of protein to help rebuild structures and rebuild uh, cellular environments that were destroyed by that process of chemotherapy. So this group looked at how uh, exercising and increasing muscle strength also helps to increase whole body lean muscle mass, which means uh, you have more protein synthesis and more protein present and more density of protein because of exercise. And, and this is within the whole body. Um, so in this case, um, whole body lean mass is representing protein density as a result of feeding and as a result of exercising. Um, so what they found is they essentially had uh, three groups and these three groups, ILRT, ART, and DEL, uh, they were different exercise regimens. Um, and over here represents one rep max strength. So the ILRT is the impact loading resistant training group. The ART is the aerobic and resistant, laning, uh, resistant training group. And the DEL is the delayed exercise group. So each one of these groups had to measure leg press, chest press, and leg extension. And we can see the group that did impact loading resistant training. So this is incrementally increasing weight. Um, well, obviously they had more, gro more growth in strength in legs, uh, some growth in uh, bench press and chest, and substantial growth in uh, leg strength with the leg extension. And basically they're comparing how these different weightlifting strategies impact total lean muscle mass, which is important after receiving chemotherapy. And you can see that the group that was doing strength training and increasing load had the, they had the greatest increases in strength, right? The one rep max was higher than any other group. 
And the group that did delayed exercise or delayed um, exercise training after chemotherapy, they had the smallest amount of strength gain. Um, and when we look, when we compare these values here to lean muscle mass, we can see that the ILRT group not only had the largest gains in muscle uh, strength gains, um, but they also had the greatest gain in whole muscle, whole body lean muscle mass. So if we compare the delayed exercise group who, who took some time uh, to begin exercising after chemotherapy, we could see that they had very little growth whatsoever. Okay. So essentially what this is telling us is that if we undergo chemotherapy, um, if we are trying to recover from chemotherapy, then strength training, especially in the weight room, doing resistant training with increasing load, um, is most beneficial for repairing the body and increasing whole body lean mass, right? Versus uh, this group that did aerobic training. Aerobic training does have some beneficial effects, but it's not as much as strength training. Um, and then delayed exercise group that uh, just didn't exercise much at all, they had they had the least amount of growth in lean body mass. So so we can accept basically what this is saying is we can accelerate our recovery from chemotherapy through strength training. We can also recover um, from chemotherapy with aerobic training, but it's less potent than resistant training. And if you don't exercise or if you delay your exercise after your chemotherapy, well then you're you're having very little low, growth and lean body mass. So um, that was a short and sweet representation on some of the most interesting things I can find right now on cancer and exercise. Um, do take notes. Um, there will be some critical thinking questions on your final exam about these slides, okay? Um, so when you just pay attention to the take-home message, is exercise beneficial for people that are living with cancer fighting cancer or recovering from cancer is exercise uh, beneficial in reducing our risk of developing cancer in the first place these are the questions that we're trying to ask and answer um, and that's all i have for you guys take care have a wonderful week